thanks everyone for joining. Sorry for the technical issues and sorry we're starting a bit late. Um, Virginia was supposed to be uh, doing the welcome, but I've just taken her place for the moment. So um, first speaker is going to be Ching Lu. She's a research fellow working with Virginia's department and she's going to be talking about health systems in Indonesia. So thanks very much, Ching Lu. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the seminar today. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge the Gakko people of the New York uh, Nation and pay my respect to the elders, both past and present. And today I will talk about a financing incidence analysis conducted over a five year period. In this analysis, we try to answer the question, who pays for healthcare in Indonesia? Indonesia is the world's largest archipelagic country. It consists of over 17,000 islands and is home to over 270 million inhabitants. Over half of its population uh, are living in the Java Island, where its capital city, Jakarta, is located. Indonesia is the largest economy in Southeast Asia. Before the COVID pandemic hits, Indonesia has maintained a steady GDP growth around 5% annually. Fueled by its strong economic growth, Indonesia has embarked its journey towards universal health coverage. Uh, before 1994, the social health insurance programs in Indonesia only covers people um, working in formal sectors, uh, civil servants, and police and military personnel. And in, 2000, uh, in 1994, people living in poverty were first included in the social, social health pro uh, insurance programs. Since then, Indonesia government has implemented a series of health reforms and health programs to expand coverage for people living in poverty. In 2014, Indonesia launched its national health social, uh, insurance pro scheme called JKN. If successful, it will become the world's largest single payer health insurance system. Mm. JKN is, uh, aims to reach a coverage of 98% by 2024. By 2019, uh, about 84% of Indonesian population was already covered by JKN. Under the JKN scheme, the Indonesia government collects premiums from waged and non-waged workers and provides subsidies for low-income uh, families. Since the implementation of JKN, the funding structure in Indonesia has changed quite a bit. Before 2014, household, um, uh, household out-of-pocket payments took up about 50% of the total health expenditure. Since 2014, the share by social health insurance has increased uh, gradually. By 2019, it has become the third largest contributor to total health expenditure uh, and take up around 22%. Although household out-of-pocket payments remains the largest contributor to total health expenditure, its share has dropped to about um, 30%. However, to maintain a healthy financing system, we should not only focus on sufficient funding, but also take equity into account. By definition, a progressive uh, or fair health financing system, the rich is expected to pay a larger proportion of the in their income than the poor on health care payments. If the poor is contributing a larger proportion of their income on health care payments than the rich, then we would say that this health financing system is regressive, which is also unfair. The last study that assessed whether the health financing system in Indonesia is progressive or not was conducted over a decade ago. Since then, there's no further information on who pays for healthcare in Indonesia. And so our, uh, the, therefore, our study aims to fill this gap and to measure how the burden of health financing is distributed across different social economic groups following the implementation of JKN. The approach adopted by our study is called financing incidence analysis. It is also known as the progressivity analysis and is a common measure of equity in health financing. In our study, we first assess the, uh, the progressivity of individual financing sources. They are di direct tax payments, indirect tax payments, social health insurance, company health coverage, private health insurance, and out-of-pocket payments. Then we assess the progressivity of the overall health financing system in Indonesia. Our study relied on multiple data sources. The major one we use is called National Health, uh, National Social Economic Survey, called Susan Nuss. This survey is conducted annually and has 
covered over 200,000 households. This survey provided vital information on the household consumption. We also used some information from the Indonesia Family Life Survey Wave 5. This survey was conducted in 2014 and collected uh, comprehensive data at individual, household, and community level. So this survey not only provides data on household consumption, but also on household income. We also used the National Health Accounts Report from Ministry of Health and Budget Reports from Ministry of Health Finance to derive the contri uh, proportional contributions of individual financing sources towards overall health financing. For data analysis, we first estimate the direct tax payments using the personal and corporate income data from the two surveys. For social health insurance, we first used the Susanna survey to identify those households who, contributing, who, who contributed to social health insurance and then calculated their contributions based on the personal income. For common health coverage, we also first used the Susanna survey to identify membership and then calculate the contributions based on their income. For um, indirect tax payments, such as value added tax and luxury good tax, private health insurance payments and out-of-pocket payments, um, they were directly derived from the Susana surveys. For, uh, to assess the progressivity, we first calculate the ability to pay using non-food expenditure data for each household. And based on the ability to pay, we calculate the Gini index. This graph shows how the Gini index was calculated. Um, the y-axis um, represents the cumulative share of income in the population, and the x-axis represents the cumulative um, population ranked by the increasing ability to pay. The blue line is the line for equality, which means, uh, suggests the wealth is equally distributed among the population. And this red curve is the Lawrence curve for distribution of ability to pay. In this case, the top 20% of the population owns um, more than 50% uh, uh, of the total wealth. And the Gini index is calculated as the area between the equality line and the ability to pay curve. We also calculate the concentration index for each source of health financing. And this line is uh, the concentration curve for healthcare payments. And it plots the healthcare payments uh, among the population. And in this case, the top 20% of the population contributes to um, around over 70% of the total healthcare payments. And the concentration index is calculated as the area between the equality line and the concentration curve. And based on the Gini index and concentration index, we calculated the CAC1 index, which is a summary score for, for the progressivity. And the CAC1 index is calculated between the area between the ability to curve and the concentration curve. If the CAC1 index is positive, it suggests that this source of health financing is progressive. If negative, it suggests uh, it is a regressive source of health financing, which also indicates inequity. And here are the main results from our study. So this table represents the Gini indices and concentration indices for each health financing sources and overall health financing um, over the five-year uh, five time period. And this graph, um, so the, the results suggest that both the wealth and healthcare payments are concentrated in the rich population. And this graph shows the progressivity of each health financing source and the overall health financing in Indonesia. Um, represented by the uh, Kakwani index. For um, the indirect tax payments were found to be regressive uh, from 2015 to 2019, uh, while direct tax payments were found to be uh, regressive, uh, uh, progressive. Social health insurance uh, were regressive, except in 2017 and 2018, uh, when it's almost proportional. Common health coverage were found to be the most progressive source of health financing from 2015 to 2019, but it became regressive in 2019. Private health insurance um, were, were uh, progressive in 2015 and 2016, but became uh, regressive afterwards. Out-of-pocket payments were found to be uh, progressive throughout the study period. 
the overall health finance in Indonesia were progressive in to, to, from to 2015 to 2018, but the progressivity declines annually and it has become regressive in 2019. So our study found that their direct tax payments in Indonesia uh, were progressive, which is consistent with findings from other countries. However, it is not progressive enough. Um, on, in other countries, direct tax payments are usually the main driver for overall progressivity. Indirect tax payments were found to be regressive, which is somehow expected. This is probably because the uh, value added tax and excess tax, tax uh, are levied equally on everyone, which means the uh, given the same amount of consumption, the poor will contribute a larger proportion of the income on indirect tax payments um, than the rich. Social health insurance uh, were found to be not progressive. This is probably because at the moment, the government is charging a flat rate of income for everyone and imposed a uh, 8 million uh, rupee salary ceiling, which means uh, if you earn more than 8 million, you only need to pay 5% of that 8 million part. So uh, for people who earn much higher than 8 million, they are contributing a relatively smaller proportion of the income on social health insurance payments. Out-of-pocket payments were found to be um, progressive, pro um, progressive in our study, which might be a positive sign, but the progressivity decreases over the study period. The major limitation in our study is how we estimate the household income. Because we don't have any income data in SUNAS, we have to use income from F5 and map to SUNAS using the ability to pay rank. Um, as a result, the estimates on direct tax payments, uh, social health insurance contribution, and uh, company health coverage contributions might not be that accurate. We also relied on survey data for household consumption. And which is subject to recall bias and missing data. And based on our study findings, we have a few recommendations for future policies. The first is to include questions on income, uh, on household income in the service, so that the future research will have access to more accurate income data. The second is to increase health financing through their direct taxes. And as according to our study findings, direct tax payments are not progress enough in Indonesia at the moment. We also suggest that the government can further uh, consider further raise the salary ceiling for JKN. And the Indonesia government actually raised the ceiling to 12 million last year, but it's still not high enough as 12 million is simply the median salary, uh, monthly salary in Indonesia. And although out-of-pocket payments are found to be progressive, it could be that the poor households are simply not seeking care, so they're not contributing much to the out-of-pocket payments. And therefore, we suggest the government continue monitoring the healthcare utilization so that the poor is not simply foregoing care and everyone is covered by quality healthcare in Indonesia. And, and I'd like to acknowledge the funding organizations and our project team. And that's all for my presentation today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chin Lu. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Virginia Wiseman, and apologies, um, especially to our speakers and all those on the call, for not being able to connect. Um, I just like to um, also acknowledge, um, firstly, the traditional owners of the land from which um, I'm joining you today, and that's the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, um, and to also pay my respects to any um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, um, people um, that are joining us today on this call. Um, so thanks a lot, everybody, and, and thank you, David, for kicking things off, and for Chin Lu for a, a very nice presentation um, on um, healthcare financing in Indonesia. Incredibly um, topical. Um, it's a very hotly debated issue at the moment. Um, as Chin Lu said, Indonesia is, um, is moving towards being the largest single payer um, national health insurance scheme in the world. Um, but it is also under a lot of pressure at the moment. It's costing the country a lot of money. Um, and um, there's a lot of debate about the um, sustainability of the system and, and um, the level of financial protection that it's offering its citizens. 
and the project that Chin Lu has been presenting um, on today, the Enhanced Project. Um, the team have um, been uh, presenting to um, the Indonesian Parliament on results from this study, so feeding um, into that policy debate. Um, so I see that in terms of um, Chin Lu's presentation, there is a question there from um, Manisha. Um, thank you very, Manish, uh, very much, Manisha, um, who's asking Chin Lu about um, um, any um, information or evidence around catastrophic healthcare spending. Um, uh, I, I don't have the information, but our colleagues from Indonesia are actually working on a paper on the uh, out of pocket payments in Indonesia. So, uh, so uh, I think if if you are interested, we can maybe um, you can follow up with that paper that will be um, submitted soon. Thanks, Chin Lu. And maybe just to add to that, um, just a, a quick kind of overview of those results that there is significant um, catastrophic healthcare spending. And what's interesting is that that. Um, uh, that catastrophic spending is also incurred by um, members of um, the National Health Insurance um, Scheme as well. So there are, there's still a way to go um, and catastrophic healthcare spending, especially for inpatient care is, is, um, is a, a real challenge. But we can certainly, um, as Chin Lu said, share that um, um, some preliminary results are perhaps in another presentation as well. Thanks, Chin Lu. Um, Manish has actually asked a, a follow-up question. Does the JKN um, have any restrictions on services that can be accessed, for example, by area of residence? This will influence access to healthcare um, as well. Do you have thoughts on that, Chin Lu? Uh, from what I know, there's uh, no restrictions on service can be accessed, um, but it should be noted that the healthcare, uh, the, the source of healthcare, uh, healthcare is quite, uh, unbalanced in Indonesia, as most of the uh, population are living in the Java Island. So those, um, so those who live in the, the in cities have better access to the health uh, care facilities than people who live in remote islands and areas. So that, yeah, I think that definitely will in influence the access to health care. Thanks, Chinlu. Thank you. And there's obviously limits. I mean, every um, um, package um, offered under an insurance scheme has its limits. Um, and certainly there are some, uh, for example, co-payments with um, inpatient care, but primary health care, um, most um, uh, types of, of primary health care, uh, it's, it, there's quite comprehensive coverage there um, at the level of what they call the biscuitness. Um Thanks, Manisha. Um, Caroline, just before we go to David, Caroline says, um, interesting presentation, what policy changes occurred in 2019 as there seemed to be a few adverse impacts in that year compared to the other years. Thank you, Caroline. Um, yeah, for the JK, I, I don't think there are any policy changes, but it's just according to the data, um, we, it looks like, for example, the company health coverage has become regressive, and this probably because the the rich, are, uh, the the poor households are starting contributing more towards on that, while the share from the uh, rich house dropped, so that that results in the regressivity of the the company health coverage, and because company health coverage has a quite big impact on the overall health financing that drives the health uh, overall health financing in Indonesia become regressive in 2019. Also, you can see that the out-of-pocket payments also, um, um, the, 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 as the progressivity decreases for out-of-pocket payments and the, its contribution to overall health financing also drops. So there are several factors that are driving the, the, the result for 2019 a bit different from the rest of the years. Great. Thanks, Chin Lu. Um, 
I can't see any other uh, questions or comments, but I'm sure that if you have any after uh, this webinar, then um, Chinlo would be more than happy to, to respond. Um, this work is um, just getting ready for um, publication, so um, should be a paper to, to share soon as well. Thanks a lot, Chinlu. So now we're going to um, switch over to um, economic evaluation, uh, which is probably an area that most people are, are, are more familiar with in terms of, of health economics. Um, and um, thanks again, David, for, for kicking off this session. Um, for those of you who don't know David, um, he is um, uh, based in the Biostats and um, Databases program at the Kirby. Um, and he um, has a background in EPI, Biostats and um, Health Economics, um, works on a lot of large trials and cohort studies in the area of HIV particularly. Um, and he's got an NHMRC Early um, Career Fellowship. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to you now, David. Okay. Thanks, Virginia. Um, and apologies, Ching Lu, for my really substandard um, introduction. I was put on the spot. Um, first of all, just let me acknowledge uh, the Bidigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, who are the traditional owners of the land that I'm on at the moment. I pay my respects to the elders past and present. So I'm going to be talking about um, an analysis that Ching Lu has actually done um, for me and um, in collaboration with a host of others um, in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, we're working on the cost effectiveness of prenatal cancer screening in gay and bisexual men in Australia. Uh, just trying to keep my slide back up. So just to give you some background, first of all, um, this is a this slide on the left, or this picture on the left is, is actually an image of cervical cancer or how cervical cancer develops, but the anal canal works very similarly. Um, so here on the left side, we've got normal skin cells, uh, and through a gradual process of dysplasia, we can get to a point where we have um, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, which can then actually progress further to high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, uh, which is considered a precursor to anal cancer. So about uh, one in every thousand or 2,000 high cell lesions will actually progress to anal cancer. And this picture on the right is uh, depicting that. So this is a high cell lesion, um, if left to its own devices, very rarely it will progress to an anal cancer. Um, so I should just mention on that previous slide, so one of the reasons we're particularly focused on HIV and bisexual men is because the incidence of anal cancer in that population is about 82 to 89 per 100,000 patient years, whereas in the general population, the incidence is about 1 to 2 per 100,000 patient years. <clears throat> so there's obviously an interest in whether screening that population can reduce their burden of anal cancer. So screening would be uh, at this stage, uh, and this is actually carried out in, in some places. Um, it's not done in Australia routinely at the moment. Uh, but the idea is that we could screen and detect high cell lesions, link those, those patients to, to high cell treatment, and that could be a cost-effective method to reduce anal cancer incidence. Now, there's a fair bit of uncertainty around whether that's actually cost-effective. So in the US, uh, it seems like screening, uh, it always comes out as being cost-effective, and that's probably why it's, it's done there fairly routinely, in, at least in parts of the US. In the UK, on the other hand, the, uh, the modeling work doesn't look so positive. Um, one important limitation from, from all those prior modeling studies is that they don't have information on the, the natural progression of high cell to anal cancer or the natural regression of high cell to non-high cell. Um, and that's where SPANK comes in. So SPANK is a, was a Kirby-led study. Um, and this publication that I've emphasized here is something that Mary Poynton uh, published a little while ago in CID, just describing the natural progression of high cell and natural regression. Uh, so we've got you know, empirical data to, to add to our model, which gives us an edge over these previous studies. There also hasn't been any cost-effectiveness work uh, on this particular topic from Australia, so not all in two particular aspects. 
Now, in terms of high soil screening, there's a lot of different options. This table on the left is something that Jeff Jin uh, published in 2017 in AIDS. And that was uh, describing the, the various different methods of screening that are available uh, and their sensitivity and specificity. So as you can see, there's a lot of different methods. And this figure on the right really depicts the fact that there are methods that have a high degree of sensitivity, but their specificity is not so good. We also have some that have very high specificity, but not so good in terms of sensitivity. And there's a bunch of screening tests that are, that are in between. Importantly, all these, these methods are fairly, fairly evenly priced. There's not much difference in the cost of, of each of them. Now, in terms of high soil treatment, there's a lot of different options for high soil treatment as well. So there's ablative treatment, surgical excision, topical treatments, and um, a few different versions of the ablative and topical treatments. The problem is nobody really knows if it works. Um, so this study uh, that I've, this slide I've got on the right is from the ANCA study, which is being conducted in the US at the moment to evaluate whether high soil treatment, um, which could be any one of these ones I've uh, put up on the left, whether that actually works to prevent anal cancer. Um, the problem with high soil is it does seem as though it's a, a bit of a game of whack-a-mole where you treat one high soil and six months later, there's another one popped up or the same one's popped up. Um, and so the, the results from that trial, or that, that trial are gonna be really interesting, but not expected until around the end of 2026. Um, so without, without data from that trial, we've had to make some assumptions in, in our model. Um, you see that as I go through. So the aim then, the detailed aim was to determine the cost and the effectiveness of high soil treatment that could lead to high soil screening among gay and bisexual HIV positive men older than 35 being cost effective in Australia. Now this is a model uh, or a schematic of the model that we are using. So patients either start in this no high soil or high soil group they can then progress from high soil to undetected anal cancer, which can be diagnosed. Uh, importantly, anal cancer often isn't actually diagnosed until fairly advanced, a fairly advanced state. So progressing on to regional and distal cancer is not uncommon, uh, probably wouldn't be uncommon. Um, sorry, it's, it's not uncommon. Um, and so in our model, from any of the cancer states, patients could have their cancer detected and go on to be treated. Uh, and obviously from any of these, these categories, patients could die either from anal cancer or from other causes. Now the screening methods we looked at were basically just chosen to be representative of those uh, core groups that I spoke about, um, where we have a method that's highly sensitive, but not so specific, one that's highly specific, but not so sensitive and, and in between. We also modeled what might happen if we had essentially a perfect screening test where, uh, 99, where we have 99% specificity and sensitivity. Um, and the reason I haven't included, we haven't included all the different screening methods is essentially because uh, they, they, the price for each of them is similar. So we really just wanted to be representative of the different types, the broad types of screening methods that are available. Now, importantly, with the, the top three methods I've got here, we included uh, confirmation of the diagnosis, of the high soil diagnosis with a high resolution anoscopy. So this is a fairly invasive procedure. It's not real present, not real pleasant. But the idea is that if you can screen patients who uh, are likely to have high soil and then expose them to HRA, and then we can confirm the high soil diagnosis and they can go on to, to have high soil treatment. Obviously, in our hypothetical situation where we've got a perfect screening test, we don't need HRA. Um, and so that reduces the cost of that hypothetical screening test. Okay, now these are just some of the parameters. I won't go over this in too much detail, but firstly, just want to emphasize this section here um, looking at transition probability. So, this is really where the spank data came in handy. Um, we had really good data on the natural regression of high soil to no high soil, uh, and also the progression of high soil to, to localized anal cancer. Um, 
and also information on the progression of no high school to high school. In terms of transition costs, uh, like I said, the different screening methods are all, um, they all cost about the same amount. Our hypothetical uh, screening test without the need for HRA was cheaper. So for this hypothetical test, as you'll see when I get to the results slide, it's important to remember it's both more effective than what we have currently, and it's also cheaper. Um, obviously with more advanced states of cancer treatment, uh, the cost went up. In terms of our background costs, so this was essentially the, the average annual cost per year of treating somebody uh, who has HIV, um, and costs went up a little bit if those patients needed to be treated for anal cancer. In terms of the health state utility, so our, our baseline utility was essentially 73% that of a, a normal healthy individual um, who doesn't have HIV and has no, no comorbidities. If individuals developed uh, regional cancer or distal cancer, then, <clears throat> uh, then the quality of life assumption would reduce. I should just mention here, because undetected localized cancer is essentially asymptomatic, we've assumed that the quality of life there is the same as somebody who has high school or no high school, which are also asymptomatic. Um, and then for somebody who had cancer and then went into remission after treatment, we assume their quality of life was slightly less than somebody who um, was in the, the baseline state. And then for disutilities, uh, this is essentially a, a short term reduction in quality of life that's associated with either high cell screening, high cell treatment, or uh, the treatment of anal cancer. So our findings, unfortunately, are summarizable in one slide. Um, so essentially, compared to no screening, all the existing screening methods that are tested cost more per patient. So because you're treating so many patients who ultimately won't go on to develop cancer or high school, who, who won't have high school and essentially won't go on to develop anal cancer, and also introducing a, a quality of life reduction to those individuals by either treating them for high school or, or just introducing as a screening method, then we're actually doing more harm uh, and it's costing money. So obviously that's not an ideal scenario. Um, and I'll go into a little bit why, why that is in a minute. So looking then at our perfect screening test, um, so even if, so for, for our perfect screening test, if we assume that the efficacy of treatment was around about 50%, we also had that, that same situation where we were doing more harm uh, and it was costing money to do that. If we got to a situation where, we, where our perfect screening test was combined with a treatment that was 90% effective, then we actually get into the ballpark of having an option that could potentially be cost effective. Now, the cost effectiveness, uh, willingness to pay threshold in Australia is around about $25,000 to, to $50,000 per quality adjusted life year gain. Um, and that, you know, that, that ballpark, that, that range is not solid, but that's sort of around about the, the range that people use generally. And as you can see, the, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is what we use to compare to the ISA, um, was just under $140,000 per quality adjusted life year gain. So still a long way off 50,000, um, but you know, at least looking better than these, these other methods. So why are our results so poor compared to especially those from the US? Now, it seems to be most likely that it's because of this, the, if you remember from uh, uh, my slide showing the parameters, our transition probabilities that we that we took from Spank show that natural regression from high soil to no high soil occurs at around about 20%. Um, there's a probability of about 20% per year of that happening. And then for the development of localized cancer from a high soil lesion, we're looking at a probability of about um, 0.22%. So very few high soils go on to, to become cancerous and quite a lot regress back to, to the state of non-high soil. And you can see this is taken from a US study, a recent US study, there's milk in 2017. And this is our sensitivity analysis, which showed that if they assumed a progression rate um, to anal cancer from high soil of 0.2%, which is exactly what we used for our base case based on spank data, then their assumption, their models showed non-cost effectiveness as well. 
uh, it was just that they had assumed uh, a much higher rate of progression. Also, their second most impactful parameter was high soil regression. So if they assumed 20% of uh, high soil regressed to non high soil, they also saw non cost effectiveness. And if you, if you have a look over at our rate of 18.7%, it's basically the same as their most pessimistic assumption. So if you combine these two pessimistic assumptions in this model, you, you're probably likely to see a very non cost effective uh, result as well. <clears throat> so what's the way forward then? Um, as I said, uh, the main limitation seems to be that a lot of individuals with high soil don't progress to active cancer. It's a rare cancer and high soil doesn't predict it all that well. So we need screening methods that are better able to predict those who have really high risk high soil, high soil lesions. So there's some work going on at the moment at this snapshot of a study is from work done looking at uh, methylation markers, which, are, which have been proposed as one potential way to identify high soil lesions that look like they're very likely to go on to develop anal cancer or become anal cancer. Another option that we've been throwing around amongst the, our research team is whether we could identify a, a specific population. So we've already focused on uh, HIV positive gay and bisexual men older than 35. Can we narrow that group down even further to a population that is really at really high risk if they have a high soil lesion, or even better if they have a high soil lesion with, with another marker that indicates that that lesion uh, could go on to become cancerous? So that concludes my presentation. Um, obviously, we're, we're at a fairly preliminary stage. These are, these are early results, so I'd be very open to hearing comments and questions. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, David. Um, I can see I haven't uh, picked up on any uh, questions in the Q&A box yet, but I, I'd quite like to then um, kick things off if you don't mind. Um, that issue about the progression, David, um, I'm just wondering why, what, on what basis were the study from the US, why did they assume a much higher? I didn't quite pick that up. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I think most of it's done with sort of um, backwards calculations. So we've got this many people with anal cancer, there's this many high soil lesions. Mm -hmm. It seems like about X percentage progress. Um, and it could just be that the data from Spank is, you know, we've got a cohort that don't have a lot of progression to anal cancer. That's one possibility. but. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the only model that's actually used in clinical data, mm -hmm. which has come from this bank study. Right. Okay, thanks. And could I also ask you just about the um, quality of life data? Could you just give a little bit of background on, on where um, those utilities came from? Were they, are they specific to this population group and Australian? Based. Yeah, I, I think Ching Lu is probably actually in a better position to answer that. Um, <laughs> do you want to take that, Ching Lu? She's done all the parameterization of this model. Yeah, for for people with high soil and no high soil, they are taken from study and that used uh, SF six. Uh, just um, they, they used the I think SF sixty to estimate the utility weight. And for the others, uh, we don't have uh, don't have utility weight for anal cancers in Australia. Uh, so we have to use the utility weights uh, from a previous published study. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And okay, any other questions or comments from the audience? So David, in the final slide, you were mentioning that, you know, one of the kind of ways forward was thinking about um, focusing on high risk population groups. So is that something that um, you've got scope under your current research or grant to do that work? Is that where you're headed? Um, it's not something I'd considered, no. Um, 
And to be honest, I think we're going to have a hard time narrowing the population down even further than what, what we have. Um, but yeah, look, it's an area that I think would be of interest. Um, we'll see. Yeah, it's not something that's in, uh, on the radar at the moment. Okay, we won't hold you on record for that. <laughs> okay, great. All right, last chance. Any final um, questions or comments? I might just also take the opportunity to say that there are um, there is a lot of uh, work going on um, at the Kirby uh, around economic evaluation. Um, and we're going to be having a number of um, uh, ongoing presentations uh, in this area, um, including some work that um, the team have been preparing for MSAC applications, for example, just to sort of, I guess, illustrate um, um, the policy relevance and translation aspects to, to a lot of the health economics work. Um, so do keep an eye out over the next um, few months for uh, further presentations from the group, um, as well as um, a next presentation, which will be, um, I believe, um, in late November, where we'll be actually focusing on health systems, some more health systems research at the Kirby. Um, and that work's going to be um, uh, presented by um, some uh, PhD students and also some staff in the program. So um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all then. I'd like to say a special thank you again to Chin Lu and to David. Um, and um, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, and, and uh, take care. <laughs>